Yeah, over to you, Anamika, please take over. They are all greetings from the Chris Network. I am Anamika, a master's student at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex, majoring in development studies and global health. The Chris Network was formed in 2021, the birth centenary year of Christopher Freeman, by a few alumni of GlobalX, guided by Professor Bankthakeel Ullawar. We have produced several lecture series under the title Chris Freeman Centenary Lecture Series. I believe our continued activity is justified by the very existential crisis that STI and innovation studies is facing today. The Global South still needs this philosophy for its sustenance and to continued growth and development. The In Conversation series portray important innovation scholars through biographical interviews. Today is our 12th conversation, wherein we present Professor Mamumuchi in a deep conversation with Dr. Margaret Holm Anderson. We have a very distinguished panel with Professor Bengta Kilundawal, Professor Gechi Karuri Sabina, and Professor Tiran Samoni. Professor Mamo is interviewed by Dr. Margaret. Dr. Margaret Holm Anderson is the academic coordinator of the Africa Alex Visiting Fellowship Program. She has more than 30 years of experience in research and planning, implementation and evaluation of development cooperation. She holds PhD in social science from the Aalborg University and has vast experience with Danida, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Danish Embassy in Nicaragua in advisory capacities. <coughs> she has been coordinating GlobalX and AfricaLX from Aalborg University and has facilitated major research conferences. Her support and intellectual leadership in organizing the AfricaLex Visiting Fellowship Program has been commendable. Margaret's most recent research focuses on development of innovative capabilities in renewable electri electrification, sustainable industrialization, and mentoring as a tool in research capacity development. She is currently an independent consultant and serves as an external examiner at the Center for African Studies at Copenhagen University. Today's program has two parts. In the first, Mamo will engage in a conversation with Margaret for an hour. Then we take a break for five minutes and reassemble for an engagement with the three panelists, Pengtake, Kechi, and Diran for one hour, and finally open house discussion for 15 to 20 minutes. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Anamika, for that kind introduction. And to everybody here today uh, for being with us, uh, it's a pleasure. I'm honored to have been asked by Radies and uh, the Chris organization in general, the, the Chris Org, to, uh, to uh, interview Mamo. It's a pleasure. Um, I have known Mamo Yu since 2013, when I joined uh, the Global League Secretariat at Aalborg University. Uh, where Professor Bengdoge Lundwald was uh, spearheading and leading the secretariat. And uh, also with Professor Ralf Mutlema and others. We had a, a great time, uh, even from the very first time we met Mamo. We've had good interactions and I have really appreciated all the possibilities we've had to interact. We met at many GlobalX conferences and at Africa Leaks conferences and so on and so forth. So, but I have never really had the chance to interview like I'm going to do today. I've never had the chance to dig as deep into your life as I hope we can do uh, today, both uh, your personal kind of upbringing, your childhood and so on, but also how you managed to get out there and become the renowned scholar uh, that you are today. 
Professor Mamu, you're the first African scholar to be interviewed in this series. And so uh, we are honored in the African Secretariat, where I'm also working, to uh, be here and uh, have you on board in this, uh, this new uh, series. So welcome to you and welcome to everybody else. Mamu, you have a long and impressive CV, but um, I would love to have you start by telling us a little bit about how you grew up, uh, where did you come from, what was your background? I know that you were from Ethiopia and from Gonda, so, but let's hear from yourself. And we need you to unmute, We, you are muted. Oh, I was, uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, I have given you a nickname. I don't call you Margaret. I call you Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> because you smile all the time. <laughs> yeah. But, so you asked me uh, yeah, an important question. Uh, when I grew up, um, uh, I grew up in the rural areas of Gondar, you know, in the surrounding of Gondar a place called Fantar. And there, when I grew up, when I was a child, I was mainly interested in uh, trees and animals. And they, I used to look after them. My uncle used to say, whenever you take them, they come very well. They are all fed and everything. When others do it, they don't do it as you do, he used to say. And I used to get upset when uh, animals get uh, slaughtered. I used to get very, I used to cry, I don't know why. I never wanted animals to be killed. Then uh, my father said, you must go to school. So he took me to Gondar from the area where I was to the city. But when he took me, uh, I was not happy because I, I was missing the animals and the trees. So I said, I want to go back. So he really, we, we had a struggle because I used to run back to the rural areas. Then he brought me back. <laughs> then, then I went to the church school. So I, for two years, I was there and I was studying the ancient Ethiopian language called Giz and, and, and also morality. There was excellent teaching about how you need to behave towards others and so on. <clears throat> After that, they said, you must go to the modern school. So I went to this Sadiq uh, Rehani school, St. John's school. And the teachers at that time were from Kerala, India. You not believe how nice they were to us. For some reason, I was, I don't know, I was good in everything. I was, just as I was looking after the animals, I started looking at the books and everything. Then I became very, I, you would not believe it. And then the teachers used to love me very, very much. And St. Joseph too used to. So they used to, uh, what uh, used to happen was every grade, I don't spend the whole time. They, they pass me. So I, I managed to finish my elementary school earlier than everyone. Then after that, I went to high school. After, uh, when I was in the 10th grade, I won what is called the World Youth Forum. Uh, it's a worldwide uh, thing. I became a winner. I wrote three essays and I became number one. Then they took me to America. Mm. So the way I went to America was uh, quite interesting. Uh, and then I've had When was this, Mamu? When was it? When did you go to, to the in, US? In, in, in 1968. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and I had a host family. Uh, I think I should show you the pictures. Very nice family. Uh, they're very nice. All right. This is uh, the father. He's called... Uh, a little bit higher. Yes, yes. Oh. This, yes, this is... <laughs> he was a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Mary Caslow is his name. Uh, he's now passed away, unfortunately. Mm. His mo he, our mother was Shirley Caslow. Mm. She was amazing. And she is now 99 years old. Wow. Uh, then I had two, a brother and sister mm -hmm. called, uh, uh, well, I don't know what I'm showing it to you. It's okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. There they are. Yeah. There they are. Yes. Andy Caslow and uh, Lisa. Lisa w went to Yale University. Andy went with me to Columbia University. So we're all brothers together. We still are to family. He even I even invited him to come to Olbo. He came, mm -hmm. he, he was in Olbo. He came mm -hmm. to visit me. So mm -hmm. so there that is the way I had the family. 
And the family said, the teachers were nice to me. In fact, mm -hmm. we had the 50 years anniversary and they were, some of them came, they were re really amazed because they asked me to give a keynote uh, of the Dwight Morrow High School 50 years. Mm -hmm. And then they said, I must uh, go to Ivy League University. So my, my host mother went to Princeton University. She asked the people. Uh, and then she also went to Colombia. Colombia first gave the scholarship, so I went to Colombia. She says, go to Colombia, better to go to New York than uh, stay in New Jersey instead of mm. Princeton. So mm. I end up in Columbia University. That's how it happened. I, I hope I, I don't want to make it long. <laughs> Is no, it it's enough? fine. Yeah, it's fine. But, but, um, but tell me, how was it to, to be a, a, an African coming to the US in 1968? It was a very special year, right? With yeah. the, the assassination. Yeah. Of Martin Luther King Jr. and so on. How was it to be there at the time? Uh, I must tell you, I was lucky to have a family like them, mm. because when I heard Martin Luther King assassinated, I was completely heartbroken. I was just, you not believe it. Then when I was crying, everything. Then they were very, very kind. They were also became like they they were progressive, uh, like people like. Meant okay. They are they are progressive people. So they what they they did was uh, very uh, together, and we uh, we took a long time to to do what must be done. How to even reach to the family to send messages, things like that. We did. We, what didn't we do? Amazing things we did, because that's what happened. And then that also made. I used to read a lot about African American situation, all this civil rights, all this racism, white supremacy, and all this. So I, I was uh, de genuinely, uh, at that time, the most interesting thing that happened was when I was in the youth forum, there was also one world, many problems. We still have many problems, one world, you see. And then uh, they had a program. The first television program I had, this is a national television, the big one. Mm -hmm. And they put me there. And then the one from uh, South Africa said apartheid was good. And I, I, I nearly stood up. I, I I didn't I wanted to hit that lady. I'm I'm sincerely telling you I was very angry. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just said this is outrageous. How how dare mm -hmm. can you say such a thing? Mm -hmm. Then my host family said, "Can you imagine your emotion, the way you expressed it?" Mm -hmm. I'm our 16 million people must have watched it. Mm -hmm. the, I sincerely speaking, well with you. They said to me, "Isn't that mm -hmm. nice?" You're yeah, very that is fantastic. They're very yeah. nice family. So they were yeah. with me, and uh, that but was you my also. Experience. Yeah, yes. and when when you started studying at Columbia University, you discovered yeah. that there were very few people from yes. from certain parts of the society. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, in the I was doing mainly physics and maths, this kind of thing. But then in the Ivy League universities, they also allow you to do uh, many things, including sport. Even the, in the social area, they also allow you to study. So you had a variety. It's liberal in, in that mm. sense, mm. and then. In the when I do my physics and maths, there was no black student. There was no Afri African American. Also, mm -hmm. women. There, I think in one of them there was only two women, two white women, mm -hmm. but no nothing. I said, why is that? I said to the dean, he's a nice man, Dean Coleman. I said, why is only one me? Mm -hmm. Why why not also you include everyone? Because it's important. In fact, in the Ivy League universities, the top universities, we should include them. Mm -hmm. Then Dean Coleman, who's so nice. Uh, he used to live in New Haven, Connecticut. He says, Mamo, good idea. I will set up fund. I will help you. You can go to the Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama <laughs> and, and attract all the black colleges. Then I used to go all the time. Yeah. Used, all the funding was given to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then and then you not believe also on the media. There was a mm -hmm. lot of times I, uh, you know, including all these things about Martha. Uh, Martin Luther King, everything we say that, that racism should be stopped. Mm -hmm. We should be united. We should be one family. Mm -hmm. We should not be fighting each other, that kind of thing. That message as a child, as a young boy, I, I passed mm -hmm. it. I didn't want fighting. I want more, you mm -hmm. know, unity. But we're also at that time, uh, we're reading also Red Star over China, Chairman Mao. We're also, we're, we're reading a lot. We're yeah. in the revolutionary yeah. times. Yeah, you know, yeah. the, the people and the people alone world make world history. Yeah, yeah but it's also thought-provoking that 
<laughs> it's also thought provoking <laughs> that there are so many. There were so many inequalities by then, and still today, yeah. the uh, the, the United States is still struggling a lot with fighting inequalities. Although more people have chances and so on, but uh, very yeah. fascinating story here. Yes, so I want to to start maybe going a little bit into some other conversations uh, topics thank and you. maybe ask you to reflect a little bit on my second question. So okay. from where did it actually occur, your interest in innovation studies <clears throat> and in national innovation system thinking? Who influenced yeah. you in going into this direction and why did it become a key priority of your work? Yes, thank you very much. My interest in innovation studies started uh, with a diffil on technology and economic and social development that I did. And this work introduced me to the great thinkers like Frederick List on the national political economy of production who in the 1980s, Chris Freeman, Dick Nelson, Bentoke Lundeval, and all the other innovation scholars. Innovation system for Africa is critical as Africa is still not applying to manage the raw materials, the manufacturing and the services by applying endogenous innovation. So the division of Africa has turned it, turned it's uh, uh, really uh, uh, not able to address the challenges of poverty, unemployment, inequality. Even the, we have the now the Organization of African Unity, 60 years now, but it is still the conflict zone of the world. Despite the fact we say we are mm. African unity, we don't mm. have any unity. We declare unity, but we practice war and conflict. Mm. But and, Mamo, and do, you, do you remember the first time you met Chris Freeman, for instance? Because he's uh, the reason why we have this series. So I'm kind of interested in taking you a little bit back in time and make you yes. reflect a little bit on these first meetings with eminent scholars in the field of innovation studies yes. and how uh, that I, influenced you. Do you yes, remember? thank you. Yes, I, yes, I, I, I came to, um, from Netherlands to uh, Sussex University uh, to do my MPhil uh, in 1979. And I finished my MPhil in 1981. MPhils usually take two years to do the mm -hmm. master's. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I met Chris Freeman in 1981. And uh, that's when I also was accepted to do my doctorate. So when I tried to do my doctorate, uh, my supervisor for uh, my MPhil was uh, called Robin Murray. And he was a chief economic advisor to Kennedy. Uh, Livingston, who is uh, um, the, the who used to be the you know the mayor of the uh, city of London, and mm -hmm. and and so when that happened, when he had this job, he said you need to get another supervisor. So the, the, then he said the, to to you uh, that you need a progressive supervisor, and I think the only person I can recommend for you is Chris Freeman. He said. Mm -hmm. So he, he he introduced us. We had a lunch or dinner together initially when he introduced us. He, in fact, he took us to his house and then he, he put us together and introduced us. And Chris was very nice. He says, no problem, Mamo, I'll be, I'll be your supervisor, he said. But after that, when he knew my story, my, my life, uh, he, he became very friendly, almost like a father, to be honest with you. Was, I, 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 I just... I'm, I'm amazed by how he treated me, uh, especially when I tried to finish my PhD in the last three months, I was a bit crazy. And then he, when he saw that, he used to come from Lewis to, to East London and make me food. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> how kind. Yeah. No, he was very kind. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. He was very, very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ben, ben Toko also used to take me to his house. He used, mm -hmm. he had, he used to cook food for he has cooked food for me too <laughs> so I, sure. can't, I can't i can't forget him too <laughs> <laughs> lots of nice people you have met on your yes, life they're very yeah. nice people i met yeah, by the yeah, grace yeah, of god yeah. maybe yeah. maybe my my mother is in heaven maybe she's praying saying please look after my <laughs> <Probably>. son <laughs> yes <laughs> so, yes so god so is mama. <laughs> <laughs> so mama what uh, 
when you reflect back, what do you actually consider to be your single most important scholarly work? Yes, okay. Um, you initially asked me uh, in the question, you asked three, what? three, I put three. It's Sorry. fine, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with one. <laughs> my, main, my main concern yes. is to find the innovation system mm -hmm. to integrate, unite and make Africa green and carbon free uh, continent. Mm. And how can we create the African innovation system to build an integrated, holistic, transformative, sustainable development for Africa. That's my main vision, my main idea. Uh, I have written a lot, now nearly 475 publications. Mm -hmm. uh, and surprisingly, I don't know why, I got a recognition from the, as a world scientist list in 2023 by including Swanee University of Technology in South Africa also in it. I don't know how this happened, uh, I'm surprised. The three most important ones is the work uh, we did with the inspiring collaboration with Bent Oke and Peter on putting Africa first in 2001, 2003. We started it with a conference in 2001. We published the book in 2003 in Olbo University. It has been provided. Uh, um, it, it has been one of the sources that provide the initial thought to create the global leaks, Africa leaks and other leaks that uh, with Bentoke's uh, foundation. It also conceptually and theoretically framed how an integrated Pan-African innovation system must deal with and respond to the unending and varied economic and social problems Africa continues to face. So the, the second most significant contribution is to have the opportunity to win the Sachi Chair on Innovation Studies run by the Department of Science and Technology and Innovation in South Africa and the National Research Foundation. They, uh, once, they are the ones that pay for it, the University of Kossing. I have now been there for 15 years. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the number of, uh, to, sincerely speaking, the number of graduates and postdocs that the chairs have supported is very hard touching. I have so many students all over the world that, and especially all over Africa, and they are all now doctors, and some of them are now becoming professors and so on. So how great to see, you know, already the postdocs and the doctorates are achieving high level jobs in the quadruple in the government, everything. Some of them are officials and you will not believe it. Some of them are now running, um, you know, becoming vice chancellors, things like that. So some of mm. a lot of students I have and I'm lucky to have them. They all also luckily they all I don't know what they're all nice to me. They always call me Papa. You're like father. So on. Mm -hmm. but, uh, my my principle is. We must serve the students. We must, the salaries to serve them, not, not to just go for your pocket and for your bank account. No, no, no. The, I say to the students, you should be my, my teachers. You should be, you, when you invent, you innovate, I feel very proud. When you, you know, just repeat what I told you, not happy. So please don't do that. I will teach you, but I want something from what I teach you something creation. If you don't do that, then I get upset, I said to them. So they, they listened to me. The other great contribution for me was the DSS chair to found the African Journal, the African Journal of Science, Technology, Innovation Development. This journal is now earning royalty and is now indexed with growing impact factor, which is, is, is coming like that, which is so wonderful. And um, I must also appreciate uh, uh, Baskaran for helping me all the time. He was very supportive. And now this journal is well recognized and the initial support for all of it uh, is produced in uh, Taylor by Taylor Francis in Oxford. And uh, the initial funding is from my chair and the chair has been very good to help me. And the third contribution is the research and work on social innovation and social entrepreneurship. I think we need to also, uh, maybe uh, I like all of you uh, to challenge you we need to rethink, relearn, redesign, re-engineer, re-science, re-innovate, all right? Even, mm -hmm. even, even re-politics and re-economics, economics. economics. Rethinking mm -hmm. innovation and development is now, uh, I'm working on it. And I'm on the process of producing a book, which I know will become something, the Innovation Scholar Committee, hopefully 
will uh, criticize, discuss, and so on. But it would at least it should provoke them, and, dis and let's discuss it, and let's see how how not to validate by merely commerce and market, but also not profit. Social value, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, social yeah. the social mm -hmm. inclusion, the environmental mm -hmm. inclusion, uh, the health inclusion. The education inclusion, all these variables, we need to create. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we need to get out of the gravity burden of of capitalist economics and come to really a new approach where mm -hmm. we use with this, you know, the mm -hmm. speed of light square, <clears throat> a new synthesis. A so new, mm -hmm. yeah. A so maybe approach. we can we can get back to all this about the vision and the future because we still have a lot of time today. So yes. there is time for we me can. to ask you a few follow-up questions on, okay. on these three or four um, uh, major uh, contributions that you have been making, right? And yeah, there, was, um, there was one more point I just- Okay, one more, okay. Yes. <laughs> there, there, there's also something we, we uh, on the entire innovation sphere, we, mm -hmm. I think we have not uh, done a good job. And that is on the knowledge of the indigenous, the indigenous knowledge, rich resources mm -hmm. exist in Africa, but it's ignored. Mm -hmm. And and mo mostly it's also uh, if it or others take it. For example, if you have a, a pharmaceutical industry, from others will take it. Everything, mm -hmm. all the knowledge others have. Traditional medicine, many things they, they don't have. I mean, at least the Chinese mm -hmm. are clever. You you uh, mm -hmm. cured uh, malaria and she got a Nobel Prize. But mm -hmm. in in Africa, we have excluded it. And, and that, again, we are now founding a new university called Osiri University, and I'm a board member there, where we are going to work very systematically, the entire education system, to include the rich indigenous knowledge in Africa. Mm -hmm. So rich knowledge, we already have written a book, but we want to continue. And uh, the good thing is, uh, my good brother, uh, Professor Diran, is also very actively engaged yes. with it, and we're working on it together. We have yeah. also so, published so papers together. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm sure you and uh, Diran, because Diran is also interviewing you today. So yeah. maybe you can dig a bit deeper into these issues Thank you. about that. Yeah, that stays. But if I may take you back to putting Africa first, right? Yes. Yes. I know that uh, Chris Freeman actually wrote the uh, the introduction or the foreword to to the book, and that you had long discussions at the time about the book, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about what were the main discussion points at the time? Yes. Um, I think the the main discussion point I remember was, you know, the, you know, Africa, we have about 54 states and they are, the states as they exist now are not functioning very well mm. to address all the key challenges that need to be addressed. The poverty challenge, unemployment challenge, all these things, they don't do it. And also, even in terms of linking with each other, with trade, all right, uh, relationships on, the, on every sphere are not working. For example, Africa still, all right, uh, uh, exports minerals, all right, mm -hmm. agriculture mm -hmm. and so on. It doesn't, so they, they can't even relate with each other because they can't export or trade with each other like that. They don't mm -hmm. create new products, new new uh, things like ma uh, manufacturers and so on. So because they have that, we I, we suggested at least I suggested that we must create um, uh, a, a unified uh, the African unity, a Pan African unity innovation approach. Mm -hmm. And the the great thing from Chris and and Bentoke is that they understood this very clearly. So when I say let's do putting Africa first, they 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 accepted it. That was so nice of them. And number two, um, uh, Chris Freeman said the Africa, the imperialists rejected will be the cornerstone of the arch. They will to Africa will have hope. It will rise. He always used to say that to me. Always, Mama, don't worry. It's, the time will come when Africa will also uh, rise. He used to say that to me. It was very nice. So. So if you see in the foreword he wrote, he, mm -hmm. or he did it like that. Even we also, uh, Ben Toke suggested that we should dedicate the book to him. And we did uh, the, 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 we dedicated for Chris Freeman. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and I think this uh, book now is read everywhere. And in fact, in the innovation uh, field in uh, in in all uh, in in Africa, it's one of the key th things that yeah. actually yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that actually yeah. has 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 been doing it. So even on this innovation. Uh, uh, white papers and everything we always mention it to them yeah. in fact recently when uh, we published a paper a book with the african innovation summit with our sister uh, professor geshi we we also put in this this mm. i remember when we did mm. the editing we mm. that that our this book has been also mentioned many times so people mm. it's, it's all over now all over africa mm. uh, it's it's uh, moving and i think it's it's critically important but still we still have challenges. The division is still very. We have the Africa Union, but the unity is not effective. And uh, yeah, if if I may ask ex yes, exactly yes. on that, because um, in your book uh, or in the book "Putting Africa First, um, I think there was this major suggesting that that you had to go to understand and use the national innovation system thinking in Africa. You needed to go beyond the national level. And actually uh, think about how to interlink and diversify the continent's social economic structure, now I'm quoting, and create new products and processes for the world economy. So um, this is taking it beyond the national innovation system, right? So yes. I wonder whether you would want to comment uh, a little bit on how you see this quote today. Where do you see the relationships between national development innovation systems and the Pan-African regional development in Africa as of today. Can you yes. think of any adjustments that you think should be required in the approach that you advocated for at the time, uh, given the, I don't know, whether we can say uh, limited progress in developing Pan-African institutions and Pan-Africanism? I know you are deeply engaged in Pan-African uh, education work and developing that on the continent, so we'll get back to that. But first, maybe on the relationship between national development, national innovation systems and Pan-African regional development. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, we we have written a book on uh, ad advance in African economic, social and political development. Innovation, regional integration and development in Africa is uh, never, I hope we, all of you will get a chance to read it. Uh, the key thing is this, what you just asked is the important. Um, the the states do not have most of them do not have national system of innovation mm. all right so south africa has this white paper in fact chris freeman was the first advisor the, in the first they have now they are now doing this the third one is coming out um 2018 mm. and now it will come every every five years or something they they do it they have done about three now but you don't get systems of innovation mm. in different well functioning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The other thing is there is not even when we try to do ASTI, African Science Technology Innovation Indicators, mm. we do need research on, on in different African countries. But again, the quality of the research is not also the statistical of it they do. I, how clear it is, is not clear. Mm. So we don't have our own innovation index. Mm. The countries don't have it. Africa-wide, we don't even have it. Um, so we have the real challenges uh, on the, in, in the context. We Even the, uh, the ASTI, the OECD, all this, yeah, Oslo, Frascati, uh, all right, Canberra, we, we should not copy it. Mm -hmm. We should also create it, mm -hmm. contextualize it. Mm -hmm. We have not done that too. So from what you just asked me, we've not done it at the Africa Union level, and we've not done it also at the specific states level. Mm -hmm. So that challenge still exists. Mm -hmm. So if, if we do it, then we could be discussing it and see what the problems are, what mm -hmm. are the weaknesses, what are the strengths, what are the threats, what are the opportunities, then we can come with an appropriate approach where we mm -hmm. can actually consolidate and do a plan that mm -hmm. actually might work and might be effective and mm -hmm. systematic. But that approach we have not done it so in africa we have still a challenge serious problem mm -hmm. and uh, this problem continues so mm -hmm. uh, what we could do is i think we need to uh, say that the africa cannot continue to be in this mineral my uh, you know uh, 
agriculture phase all the time, even in the, during this time of digital technology. You all right? I mean, it's not good to, that it continues to be like that. So we need to find a solution. And and we, even now, if we trade, you know, we have the uh, inter-African trade. Exactly. What does what do you trade? The same goods you cannot, yeah. Yeah. unless you create new products. I mean, yeah. it's not possible to trade. So inter-European trade is nearly 70%. Inter-Asian mm. trade is nearly mm. 60%. Inter-African trade is not even 10%. It's incredible. Mm. So we are so <laughs> weak. We are so divided and weak. And mm. we are conflict-ridden, coup d'etats, mm. corruption, mm. many things. We have, and then external actors also interact with internal actors and so on. And so we have many challenges, uh, my Margaret. Yeah. What, what would be your first advice to the national governments if they were to create better functioning national innovation systems? I think the best would be to create, and that's what exactly our book, the Putting Africa First, The Making of African Innovation System. Mm -hmm. The title of the book answers the question. We need an African integrated innovation system. We need to know exactly how we're going to connect. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, all what resources we have, how mm -hmm. to also manage them, how mm -hmm. to use them, how to add value to them, mm -hmm. how we can create the African value chain. Mm -hmm. All these things have to be done systematically. Exactly. Otherwise, if we don't do that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, Africa, uh, remains always in the mineral raw material agricultural value chain. Yeah, yeah. This is not good at when the global value chain is driven by the exponential mm -hmm. technology with digital nanotechnology, biotechnology, and cognitive technology. So we need to come out of it. You see, mm -hmm. uh, more resources still flow out of Africa than what, what comes in from yeah, yeah. outside. Yeah. Africa is a donator, it's mm -hmm. not donated. Mm -hmm. Huge amount of resources flow out of Africa. Six mm -hmm. times more resources flow every time. Yeah from yeah. Africa, over 50 billion. I mean, uh, uh, the, another one uh, professor said from uh, Ireland, he mm. said, uh, Patrick Bond, he said, Mamo, he said uh, 50 billion. Actually, what Africa gives is over 70 billion, he said to me. Yeah. Every year it goes. So Africa mm. to develop those who claim to mm. donate to Africa by a huge amount of his wealth flowing mm. out with, without interruption. So the, there is a need to, without fail, to find new creative, innovative ways to create an integrated, sustainable development path mm. by using the innovation system approach. Now, more than at any other time, when the world is now going through this extraordinary time, difficult time as well, at the same time, also exponential technology time. We don't want this digital technology and artificial intelligence, all this knowledge economy to also mess us up. We should mm. not lose, be a losers. In this mm. fourth industrial revolution, we're losers in the first industrial revolution, the second mm. industrial revolution, the third mm. industrial revolution. Mm. We must not be losers in the, this fourth and fifth industrial revolution. Africa, no, I remember coming to, yes, to yes. Zimbabwe and Zambia many years ago, 1990 or something like that. And there was actually quite a lot of industrialization at the time, but a lot of it also got lost in the process. Yeah. Uh, um, so mm. textile industries were, you know, wiped mm -hmm. out and and all this. So something went wrong on the on on the way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in to some extent, the COVID nineteen pandemic actually refocused attention on this need for Africa to put Africa first, for Africa to to uh, yeah to unite in a way uh, and and do more in that sense to industrialize also on the African continent. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we could have a long discussion about that. Yes. <laughs> but I need to take you on to the next question. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, you have over the years contributed to a, a range of research capacity building activities for young scholars, not least in Africa. And um, as uh, Bal has just put it in the in the chat here, uh, your your contribution by founding the journal uh, on the ASTI journal is is probably one of your biggest contributions. But you've also been involved in the Global Leaks and the Africa Leaks Network, the Africana Postgraduate Academy, and many other research capacity building initiatives for young people. So could you could you tell us a little about bit about what do you think were your major contributions in that field? And also, 
for everybody to learn from this, what and from your vast experience, what do you think are the main lessons learned in terms of how to do good research capacity building? Yes, um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I don't know whether I should say to you the, the most important contribution. I have taught in many universities uh, all over the world, but the one I like now is in South Africa. The reason is I, I was able to create a course, advanced course on creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship for technology venture creation. And the good thing is that I say to the students, unless you form into a team, team, and then set up venture, real venture startups, uh, I will not give you a mark. I will not pass you. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, luckily I, I used to be a mentor in the African uh, Entrepreneurship Award. So I was able also to say to them, I can also contribute seed funding for you. And then you also must contribute. So some of them were even able to sell their cars and so on to, to get the contribution. And a lot of them uh, form uh, really venture startups. They created them. So I thought that was the most interesting thing that happened, meaning these young people, they create. And then I also insist to them, at least all of you, even if you don't publish it, at least also not just produce, a, 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 you know, a, a, I give them assignments, about six assignments. One of them says, can you also write a working paper? Something like that. So produce, so they become also uh, interested. So I made them more practical. And then I said, when you innovate like that, you make me so happy. When you just uh, repeat the same thing I told you about all the courses I, we, we do, uh, it's not good enough. So that's what I, I just mentioned to you earlier. I mentioned to them, this is one of the good things I really feel I uh, have done. It's, it really inspires me myself for, for seeing these students taking it seriously. And they take a number of weeks to just know what to choose. And especially in South Africa, you know, South Africa, there is a bifurcated economy. There's, a, you know, townships and so on. And in the rural areas also, there are some issues. We tried, I, we, they tried to create some ideas that will help in the, the, the communities in the, that are, uh, in the, you know, on the bottom of the pyramid. So I think things like that have happened. So I think mm -hmm. the I can't, con I mean, other things we have done, but... I think the most important, I mean, of course, the students that graduate, everything that's I've already mentioned to you, but I think the most important one is this, this course. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to develop also this problem-based learning, action-based learning, mm -hmm. uh, project-based learning, all right? And mm -hmm. I think this kind of uh, approaches to really make uh, a, a new relationship mm -hmm. uh, with between also the, not just uh, teaching ourselves, but also including the other sectors, uh, quadrupled helices. And, and this, I think this linkages also with the indigenous knowledge to all these things I mentioned to you, that I think new approach is necessary and we need also transdisciplinary approaches, not just uh, discipline in silos, things like that we need to do develop. And I think I'm working on it and uh, more advanced. And I think we should develop also new curriculums. I mean, I think uh, there's uh, a, yeah. uh, we need mm. to do that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, because the uh, curriculum development, I think, is also very critical to to not. Uh, we've seen within the Africa Leaks Network that people uh, there are uh, uh, there's a lot more now to reference also coming out of the African continent, and and that's partly because of of your journal, the or the journal you started on the uh, on the African Journal on Science, Technology, and Innovation and Development, right? Yes. So could you also maybe reflect a little bit on that process and how it was like to start that journal? What were the main obstacles and and uh, how have you actually made that a success? I know Bakaran is probably behind it too, but uh, <laughs> but maybe the, to, the, together, how did you make it? Yes, the, the journal uh, was initially, uh, the publisher was Adonis Abbey Publishing. Uh, then from that publisher, we took it to uh, Taylor Francis. But the, as I mentioned to you, because I have a grant with my chair, so I was able to pay initially to support the journal. 
So from my grant, we paid. I, in fact, I, uh, I even Taylor Francis, I was paying until uh, last year. Uh, I think we finished in 2022. Um, so now it's free. Now, now they they are giving us royalty. So until that happens, we, we the payment side was uh, a challenge, and uh, but luckily I was able to pay for it. But the other thing is that the journal now is uh, known. So lots of uh, remember the problem with uh, the scholarships in Africa. I mean the the young people when they send publications uh, to journals sometimes they charge them a lot of money and sometimes also they reject their papers uh, for not maybe i don't know how whatever reason they have they do so now this journal is good that it's open uh, mm, definitely yes, and yes, over, yes. over 70 percent of the publications are from uh, african uh, african scholars so which is mm. good that they got now they have their own independence meaning they have we invented something for them to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, develop their research capacity. So we have done that. The journal has been good, but you know, the journal now there's so many people uh, submit. The backlog is a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, uh, it it is a ch challenge. The the journal initially was uh, I don't know three issues and so on. Now it's become seven issues a year. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, in fact it it needs to be developed. In fact, we asked uh, them to add another one to make it eight, but they said let's keep seven. Mm -hmm. But still, there is a lot of challenge because a lot of people uh, sometimes uh, you know they complain that uh, they, they they took time to mm -hmm. publish and so on. So we have mm -hmm. this kind of challenges, but still the journal is going very well, mm -hmm. and hopefully it will be good. The time will come when we all also pass it on to. Uh, to uh, other uh, uh, publishers, to to, to co-edit, like chief editors. So maybe they, they they could be. So I also work on a another journal. We'll, we'll discuss it about also uh, mm. on uh, with another professor. He's a very nice professor also uh, uh, on uh, uh, creativity, social innovation, social entrepreneurship. Also, mm. uh, we have that journal too. Yes, and then I, being... I another mm -hmm. journal also. On, uh, yeah, open up this journal on uh, innovation foresight it's uh, ethiopia related but one of the universities in ethiopia now has taken it which is so good yeah i think it's been wonderful that when you are at the africa leaks conferences and global leaks conferences you're always wearing that hat too so you are always <laughs> also there to look for people with good quality papers that you can encourage to apply for yes. uh, publishing and so on. And, and mm. uh, I think it's really critical for yes. uh, a community like uh, like the innovation and development uh, mm. community, both globally and on, Af on the African continent, to have these kind mm. of outlets where mm -hmm. there can be a dialogue between scholars and so on. So uh, mm. I think we are extremely lucky to have you uh, being spearheading that process, Mamo. So I, I want That's to thank you for that. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> really. So we don't have too much time, but we have a bit of time for the last two questions here from my okay. side before we pass on okay. to the to the panelists. Okay. Uh, so my my next question to you is really about what you consider to be your most important contributions to influence policies and practices. And I know you've talked a little bit about the development of this course, um, uh, the advanced course on creativity and so on, uh, as a very important contribution. But so maybe also now talk a little bit to how you have tried to influence uh, national policies or international policies uh, through your scholarship. And what, what have been your major contributions, you think, in that that field is it the South African IS policy white paper where you contributed or maybe something completely different that I have never heard about. Yeah, thank you very much. But I think one of the things uh, I should start with is from what you said about the innovation system in Africa. I tried to develop a comprehensive curriculum on the innovation system when I was uh, in the faculty of uh, economics and. Uh, finance in uh, Swanee University of Technology. But for some reason, uh, they, the, the, the process, the, they, for whatever reason, they did not 
process it the, in the university bureaucracy. Uh, I, would the, I, I can send you the, I think the concept, I don't know whether you, I don't know whether I sent it also to Bal, Bal I don't know whether if I remember. I know I had to send it to Professor Zelek Orbu and others, uh, they, they all looked at it and they were very happy. And we said, let's develop a serious course on uh, how uh, great we develop a strong innovation system curriculum as the research outputs since the 1980s, since initiated with Frederick List, as very rich. So how great we create a knowledge paradigm shift mm -hmm. with innovation and unity of knowledge mm -hmm. um, for Africa, we said. So I, I tried to not just make it disciplinary silos, but break out of that boundary and create something with the innovation system where we bring in the economics, the social, all other aspects also included. So this way, the, the younger generation could be motivated. We, we, I was thinking, I, 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 let me find the, the curriculum. I could send it to you again. But I think we still need a curriculum on the innovation mm -hmm. system area. And I think a lot of you who are in the, you know, now that you are uh, listening to me, uh, uh, you don't, I don't have to do it. I'll be happy to collaborate with you and we could work on it and really in include it. I also tried very much uh, with the Africa Union um, Commission. Uh, we, we said, let's create uh, a Pan-African Education Commission. Again, I developed the whole course, including even the curriculum, uh, what modules that need to be developed with uh, not only me, I had other friends from America and others um, who were involved. We did it together. We submitted it in 2015 to, um, to the Africa Union Commission, but we never had a uh, response from them. Uh, that's another challenge we have. So I think the problem is even in the intellectual side, we also have uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Even if we say intellectually, let's try to do something mm -hmm. original and very interesting and something useful, mm -hmm. the other people who are not, they do not support you. So we have these uh, challenges. I, I think we that is something we need to address. Maybe not on all of us in the innovation community, since it's been going on from the 1980s to now, so many, many years, I think there must be very systematic. I know probably in Europe and others you do it, but in the, in the African context, in the developing country context, I think we should also include very systematically to use how we used innovation, knowledge, imagination to really change the mindset of people from, uh, you know, going into all kinds of crazy things to move into learning, innovation, competence building, as, as Ben Toke said, we should really move into that sphere, into that direction, not into the... But I think we are very... Direction. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll, I'll be happy, very happy to see uh, what you have developed, and and we'll be happy to collaborate on on trying to move Thank that you. agenda forward. I think that would be lovely, uh, really great. Thank you. But Mamo, uh, when you think back to the policy papers, um, so by governments and so on, have you also tried to influence those? I know you have just been yes. evaluating uh, an an African skills program. Maybe mm. you could talk a little bit to how you see. Uh, the policies of different governments and how you try to influence policies. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. there's the, the interesting question there is that they they want is is actually the co competition to develop universities, Tibet colleges, um, and the how do you also include those that are excluded, uh, the vulnerable? All right, the people that normally. Have the young people that do not do not get the opportunity to go to universities. What kind of things should we develop? Even if they don't come to school, uh, they are at home, how could you also develop courses to make sure that they get trained? We worked on this very systematically. It was fascinating. In fact, now in the Tibet colleges, uh, Barry Masoga is a very good friend, uh, works very much. Uh, he's uh, the, the one who introduced me to Madiba and make, make, make me hug Madiba. He's very, very, uh, very good now. He just wrote also a very good thing about the Tibet colleges. And then we are, we are now discussing it and uh, to see how we can actually upgrade the Tibet colleges, make them more inc inclusive and develop really systematically how all the young people, the rural area, the women, all of them that 
are uh, not able to join because of all the life pattern they lead, how we could also reach out to them. So start up. That from is, the that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Uh, and and yes. I think the uh, the balancing of different types of capabilities and capacities and mm. competences in a national innovation system would mm. would benefit a lot from that. I mean, even in, yeah, so so many countries where we we do not have enough skilled people because everybody wants to become an academic <laughs> these days. Yes. So wonderful that you're doing work in in that but field as well. The other important can... thing about South mm -hmm. Africa is uh, our beloved Chris Freeman was an advisor to the South African uh, White Paper the first time. South Africa is trying to create the South African Innovation System. At least give them credit to South Africa; they are working on it. They have the, the third time they have tried it, but South Africa still has big challenges. It's mineral rich, 16 minerals it has, trillions, but poverty, unemployment, inequality persist. There's a need for the economic CODESA. They used to have what they call economic uh, political CODESA, but the economic relationship is still is fractured. So the bifurcated. So the sovereign wealth fund, like Norway is necessary. Uh, I suggest to the DSI, uh, the Ministry of Science Technology, uh, Dan de Toi and others, all the key guys, um, they're very nice and friendly. Uh, they were positive about it, and they even have set up something, but it's not yet fully applied. But at least they listen because the Ch the Norwegians have done a very good thing. They uh, when they got a little oil in 1996, they set up what the sovereign wealth fund. Now that has made that is accessible to all the people of uh, Norway. Something like that is. Uh, I think that's what we need to do now. Uh, uh, you know, we we really Africa cannot copy the economic growth uh, pattern uh, from other parts. So even in the white papers and the innovation system, we need to also t tell them exactly what kind of economic growth pa uh, pathway is um, uh, needed, and that is something I I, I also like uh, I like us to do very systematically and. Uh, and to really create a new Pan-African innovation system by learning and building uh, from the past uh, inventions, innovations by using science, technology, engineering, mathematics to create jobs for the youth in Africa and transform the agricultural uh, raw material mineral economy. This is a critical time. So new transformation innovation system approach must be generated to a new co-evolutionary integrated sustainable African development. Yeah. Africa, from the raw material, mineral, agricultural value chain to the knowledge, economic, global value chain the world is in at the moment. I think we need to work on that systematically. Yeah. Thank you. And I can see there are questions to you in the chat that we will get back to uh, uh, a bit later. But um, there are some questions about the elements, what elements of the NIST that you would find relevant and necessary for a country to be competitive and sustainable in the global scene. But I think we can get back to those when okay. we have the open discussion. Thank you. So, um, my last question to you uh, is about what do you actually consider to be the main challenges for African innovation and development studies in the coming years? So, what are the major challenges for African innovation and development studies as we as we think about it? How may scholars in the field best contribute to Africa's development? And I think it links up nicely what what with what you were just talking about, actually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We need a new innovative economic system. As I mentioned to you with a new validation criteria, with nature, human, and economic gains at the output to measure productivity. So we need a new model, a new paradigm shift. Africa has to break out of the narrow, only for profit global value chain. It must go for co-evolution, not linear path of both profit and non-profit social and nature wellness gains are critical. A new transformative innovation economic path that combines nature and social well-being is urgently required. A new innovation imagination is needed to bring about a totally new humane and green innovative economic growth. Well-being multiplication, no subtraction. Nature mm -hmm. safety rather than damage must re-engineer the whole African economic, economic, uh, economic uh, development future. So a new innovation sustainable and integrated system that synthesizes with creativity and, it, and uh, by making sure that state with private market with planning, economics and politics are combined to make profit with non-profit and social entrepreneurship, social innovation, not individual entrepreneurship, 
is critical to make a new sustainable integrated African development system by embedding a total innovation, innovation, learning, build capacity building, all right, culture. Mm -hmm. Africa has to embark on a new co-evolutionary path by applying knowledge, learning, innovation, competence building, meaning global leaks, Africa leaks, for developing a sustainable integrated African, African knowledge economy. So we need a new innovation system, and that's what I strongly recommend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Thank you. That was a wonderful way of, I think, uh, almost uh, concluding our little chat here, the one hour. It's amazing how time has flied. <laughs> and it's been wonderful to talk to you about these things. I feel I tempted to ask you one more question, but I think Rajesh <laughs> will not allow me. So, <laughs> no, Rajesh, you... am I right? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, you... no, let's, I think as per schedule, let's, Go for the break and exactly. then later yes. let's come back yes. with the questions. No problem. You can ask there, your there, question, Margaret. Yeah. No, no, it's there, fine. I, I really want to, yeah. <laughs> they are, you are asking me very difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been good. It has been good. My, my, um, my compliments. And and uh, and thanks a lot. So everybody yes. out there, uh, we will now have a five minutes break. And um uh, Mamu, I want to thank you sincerely for this first and in-depth part of the conversation. It has been a big, big pleasure. Thank so you so for... much. I thank you. I thank you more. Thank you. <laughs> so for everybody now, a uh, five minutes break uh, or so. So we meet uh, five minutes past three here in that's Copenhagen time. I think it's 4.05 in East Africa and probably something else somewhere else. So, uh, but five minutes break, and then we meet again. And uh, after the break, we will hear from the panelists. They will have a chance to interview Mamo. Okay, enjoy Thank your you. break. Thank you so much. Great. So we have uh, two announcement uh, during the break. Let me, let me, we have two programs, forthcoming programs. Let me just uh, share the screen. Hope it's visible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is the first program. We have uh, on sixth of June, uh, Oxford University is organizing uh, a seminar on global South in the age of digital revolution, uh, organized by Shaolin Fu, and uh, we have a. Uh, a great panel, uh, Professor Richard Nelson, Professor Ben Toke, Professor Ling Gay, and Professor Christopher Adam. This is on 6th of June, and uh, you can scan the QR code, or I'll put the, the, the registration link in the chat immediately after this. So try to participate in this event. Our next uh, conversation program is on 21st of June. We feature Francisco Lusa, uh, interviewed by Maria Enrica Virgilito. And we have uh, three distinguished panelists, Valeria Cirillo, Lugi Marenko, and Mario Simoli. So this is on 21st, June 2023. Uh, we will, as usual, we will send you the invitation and the link, et cetera. My Rajesh, is it okay? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Great. You spoke no. well. Very okay. good. <laughs> so when you pass it, then I'm I'm happy.
<laughs> so I got a pass mark. <laughs> <laughs> you got a distinction. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Is a uh, our our Lundus? She taking pictures. Tell her to take pictures. Always nice to take a nice picture of you and me. <laughs> <laughs> you look much younger. Yeah? Me? Yes, because of, uh, I think Australia <laughs> makes you younger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take lessons from you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That's very nice. Phew. It's quite a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, questions. Yeah. Yep. Not mm. many. Not many. There are only, only we, we have only two questions so far. Yeah. Okay. From from the from the from the panel. the panel. Uh, panel panel you have three. Then from the floor we have two questions so far. Okay. From the floor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Do 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 you, do you tell me? You ask them the question. You tell me. Is it? You'll ask me. Oh, definitely. We will okay. we will let them ask directly. We have oh, directly. Questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. They can ask. Okay, very good. Definitely, definitely. Wonderful. So we have another hour. Right? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. But uh, my Ade uh, said she was she couldn't join because of the class. She has a class. So she. We will said, send her the recording. No worries. Yes, we are recording okay. it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is yeah. Safe. Yes. We'll yeah she likes it. to listen send to it. it. Yes. Yep. 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 Yes. Yes. Yes, so we'll uh, it'd be nice. So uh, nice to also see Anemika, which is nice. Yeah. It's time, Margaret. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> hi again, everybody. Hi again, yes. Uh, you know, I'm from the Africa Leaks community, and there we always do a little bit of stretching in between. So if somebody <laughs> feels like stretching, they should do it now. They can uh, roll your yes. shoulders or yes. do something yes. like no, 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 you don't get away, Mamo. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> that was a very bad idea. Sorry, Rajesh, I'm spoiling the program. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back, Mamo? <laughs> I'll, be back. I'll be back. You'll be back. Okay, that's good. You should have taken the break while the rest were taking. <laughs> ah, okay. So I want to welcome everybody back. I uh, hope you're ready for the second part of the session where uh, we will have uh, questions to Mamo, if Mamo comes back <laughs> uh, from the panel. Mamo, are you there? Hmm. I can't really see him around the corner. Can anybody see him? <laughs> you made a real mistake. I made Margaret. a very big mistake, sorry. I'm back, I'm back. Ah, that's wonderful. I, I did some exercise. Yeah, good. Okay, that's great. So without much further ado, I want to pass the floor to uh, Professor Bengdoge Lundwald, who um, I have to say, after having worked for many years in practical development cooperation, when I came back to Olbock University in 2013, I felt like coming into the Global Leaks Network and uh, starting with Africa Leaks, it was like getting an academic home. So I'm very pleased to now pass on the floor to Professor Bengdoge Lundwald, who is a Professor Emeritus in Economics at Olbock Business School, but also you are attached to Lund University. What is your question to Mamu today? Uh, before I put the question, I, I would like uh, to say a few general words. Um, you know, being a scholar in uh, Africa, Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not easy to get visibility outside, uh, not even inside the continent. All the communication systems, uh, the scientific publication systems, and everything are extremely biased in favor of the North and especially uh, Anglo-Saxon speaking countries. Uh, so uh, I would just say, Mamo, that you have come further than most other African scholars uh, in spite of this uh, general handicap. 
And uh, I, I, I wrote something on the chat that uh, I sent a, a paper to Rayesh, uh, uh, which was about scientific publication. Uh, somebody made a systematic uh, study of who has access and who has not access and who is cited and who is not cited. And, and it's really neocolonial. <laughs> quite extreme. It's quite extreme. And this is why I think uh, that you succeeded to establish this journal uh, was really important. I think perhaps the most important thing you have done. I, I think so, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, and then um, a few other comments. I mean, you have a very rich language. And sometimes it might be a little too rich. I mean, you get carried away and you uh, propose so many fantastic things, uh, not always being completely concrete on how to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You say, we know, need a new innovation system with a new of that and that and that. Perhaps, uh, probably you're right. Probably you're right in everything you say, but we need to be more specific saying, how, oh, how, oh, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good advice from an old professor. <laughs> Thank uh, you. We and have... now to your question. <laughs> oh, <okay>. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, uh, I think my rate is very prof as uh, 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 interviewer and, and leader. So, and of course I have to do what she says. No, I, I, I just note that we are in a, a, a new world situation where you have increased rivalry between uh, great powers, uh, most visibly between United States and China. Uh, but, uh, and at the same time, we are in a situation where Africa actually has uh, some very uh, uh, scarce and important resources, uh, for instance, in, in minerals for developing uh, uh, the electrical car. And um, my question to you was, uh, could you, could you discuss, think a little about what, what, what is the possibility that single countries or African Union or some regional collaboration uh, could uh, make sure that uh, Africans get more value from these minerals? And, and uh, have you seen any good examples of knowledge transfer uh, from China or other countries in this uh, context, which could make it possible for African countries to further develop the minerals and, and move towards the batteries and e-vehicles, etc. That was, I think, my question. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the question and your comments. Uh, what you just said about the practical side is uh, also very important. Uh, we need, uh, it's not easy, for example, to have people who do uh, like economics for uh, market commerce profits to change to uh, to to also validate it with social gain environmental gain all these things they may not do it but what it needs is the, we need a mindset change that is not easy i mean the practical side we could prove it we could show how it can be done for example the chinese have created what they call market uh, social market, social commerce. They say that they, what they say is, when you, uh, when they open the economy to the rest of the world, they say that the state must also be a shareholder, B meaning the private holders also gain, give something also to the state from the profit side, and that is used for the people. 
So some new relationship needs to be done. We can learn from the Chinese example about how they have done it. And then also see if we could also do it in, when, when we do it in Africa. That's what I meant by social innovation, social entrepreneurship, how you can take one by giving one. Some, some new approach needs to be developed. And we need to create a new uh, model, a new uh, really economic uh, innovation model that actually allows us to do this. I think, let me work on it uh, systematically and then see if your criticisms and critical feedbacks are critically important. And I value what you just said, make it more practical is very good. The second question you asked me is very important. Uh, in the, the time we are in now is tough. And what you just said is uh, important. The, the minerals I, made, I found that are used for, uh, 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 for energy cleaning are copper, nickel, manganese, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, zinc, rare, the rare ones that you mentioned. But the ones, most of them are in Africa, uh, especially cobalt. Uh, is used uh, for rechargeable battery electrodes and to manufacture super alloys also. It was used for that. And it's, you know, who, 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 who gives the largest, who is the largest producer? Nearly 70% of the cobalt is produced by the DRC. I'm, I always mention to you, the DRC is a mineral resource rich. It's over 24 trillions. That's what the minerals she has. Somebody said in 2009, that was more than the combined gross national product of all of Europe and America. Franz Fanon used to call it the heart of Africa. So the, it has that, but you know, it does not benefit. From what I see, others benefit, all right? The United Kingdom, China, America, all of them, all of them benefit, but the DRC exploit only 3.5% of the global output from this. The others gain all the, from the, the, so this is Africa. Even in this electricity battery, everything, I just give you one concrete example. I can, I can go through each, each of the minerals and you, you not believe what I found. You, 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 that's kind of you to ask me that question <laughs> because you made me do research <laughs> and and I was just amazed uh, to find what the challenges are for Africa. I think we have a problem. Even on the green, uh, clean energy technology uh, side, using our own minerals, we are, we are not doing it. Others are doing it, are benefiting. The Chinese are benefiting very much. And I didn't see very much what the, the specific things the Chinese do to actually say, the, the mutual benefits must be done between the countries that get the minerals and the China that does the uh, technology to clean it. So, uh, and there is also the challenge between uh, America and and uh, China and so on. On this issue, it's critical uh, differences they have. Uh, the most amazing thing that I saw is how China is involved in almost all of them. And she, they are doing amazing things on the on the on the different things. Uh, how can I say to you? The, uh, they do it on. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, what's it? They do it on uh, green electronics. They use uh, many things like that. Uh, they have done it, uh, the, but the, the but the shareholding and the firm side the control side is also not collaborative. So there is also that uh, serious problem. And there is also in the, even on the rare earth elements, China dominates. Uh, uh, they use it in electric vehicles, wind turbines, energy efficient fluorescent lighting and other items needed for the energy transition. Uh, China has considerable control over both the reserves and the production. Uh, and I think this is what is happening and uh, so there is a problem. 70% of global reserves, they say, are with China, holding a little over all of them, most of the reserves. That's what I see. So from what you asked me, I think uh, it's a difficult uh, time we have in terms of 
this uh, creating glee, uh, green, uh, clean uh, energy uh, in the so the, in the climate change, all these things are and the conflict is happening. The same thing we see in conflict with the Ukraine and Russia. We're also seeing conflict in the use of these uh, resources and also the exploitations. Everything are continuing. Nothing has changed, which is sad. And this technology is not allowing us to change. We should be trying to do innovation to actually bring uh, mutual beneficial relationship. That is not what I see from what I from what you asked me. Thank you, my well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Do you do you have any follow up questions, Bal? Uh, just a comment. I mean, <laughs> what is quite obvious is that um, African countries, <laughs> individually or together in some uh, formation, need to make better deals. Yeah. Uh, with the rest of the world, including the Chinese. Uh, and today, I think the rest of the world needs to listen, uh, also because of the big international conflict. There is an interest to find allies outside, including in Africa. So I think uh, this is what uh, governments or African Union or regional associations in Africa should make an attempt, take it openly, saying you might get access to our resources, but then you give us some more knowledge to process these minerals. And of course they will say no, if you do not uh, come with uh, support, enough uh, strength. And, and this is, there is why I think you're an African vision actually could play a role. But that's all just my immediate thoughts as a comment follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. That's very good. Super. And in the interest of time, I think I need to pass on the word now to our second panelist, that's Getsi, uh, Getsi Karuri Sabina. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Getsi, wonderful to have you here too. Uh, you are an associate professor at the Witz School of uh, Governance, and uh, you're hosting this African Civic Tech Innovation Network and doing a lot of different things. And uh, you're also a member, a very, very esteemed member of the African Scientific Board. Loving to have you here. What is your question to Babu? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Marguerite. And uh, Mamo, it's such an honor to be able to be here with you uh, and about you <laughs> today. Um, <laughs> I'll have to, without asking Marguerite to take a moment also just to share a little bit uh, because pra praise singing is in my culture. So I have to start with some praise singing because I've known Mamo now for, I think, uh, uh, close to two decades. And uh, first as a supervisor, as a mentor, now very much a friend uh, and very much a person who I consider to be a living legend. So um, I just wanted to share three observations about this because for me as, uh, at the time, a young African scholar, and I know that he continues to be this for so many other people. Uh, Mamo was a very, uh, I should say, let me address you. You've been a very important way, I think, for uh, many of us to, to deal with a schizophrenia that many African scholars uh, otherwise face, where we have this schism between our lived experiences, our politics, the issues we see, and then the kinds of performances required of academia and scholarship. So sometimes these can seem like two different things, but I think in your person, uh, what I experienced was, and I said these three things, the one, a thought leader and an innovator who activates us uh, and activates the innovation systems actually around him uh, by creating initiatives, courses, institutions, you know, and we've heard from you today that this goes way back to your young days when you would start things if there was uh, an issue. You're not afraid to start and to lobby for the support behind those things and you start again if necessary. And so I've learned this from you. Uh, you've also been a scholar who completely and unapologetically embeds uh, activism within your scholarship. Uh, and so I think this consistent call to arms uh, really reminds us that there is both for Africans a major challenge to confront, but also a great resource uh, in our Pan-African capabilities, our intellect, our labor, 
Uh, and I think you've also shown us how we can still straddle that with leveraging global friendships and partnerships and institutions, whether it's Europe or China or America, but with dignity uh, and also with clarity about what it is we are trying to do. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, and then thirdly, that you've always lifted us up. Uh, I think it's very possible to achieve what you can uh, and then to be satisfied to be the first and only the greatest of all times, as they say, the GOAT, uh, and just to carry on your merry way. But you've always used your platform actually to pull people up uh, and to call attention and shine a light on other people. Uh, I've experienced that from you in my life. Uh, uh, and again, thank you for that. So, so thank you for being who you've been. I think for so many of us, uh, we don't have enough reference points like that as Africans. And I think you're really showing the rest of us how to be a, a scholar and how to be a great intellectual uh, in this space. So thank you. Now, Thank what I was asked much. to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm honored to be invited to, to interrogate you on this platform. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I've tried to share, I mean, and then you shared beautifully in your story, uh, is just how you've had this journey that in many ways has been uh, very international, uh, a, a career and academic journey that has really taken you all over the world. But importantly, early on, took you out of your home country, uh, uh, Ethiopia. And many of us have also traveled that path of studying elsewhere. And some of us have come back and some of us haven't. Um, and, and sometimes it can cause some contradictions because we obviously want to build our own systems and our own institutions. So the question I wanted to put to you is, is how do you hold these contradictions uh, between being uh, Pan African on the one hand, but also in this very globalized knowledge field where we are sometimes <laughs> by choice, sometimes by force, so all over the place. Um, uh, how have you held your contradictions? <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting question. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind words, but you, you have also been uh, teaching me a lot. So you're not just uh, my students, and I used to tease you a lot too, so, so you're very nice. Um, um, the question you asked me is uh, critically important. I must tell you this. I don't know all of you, I don't know, it's private. When uh, I first went to America uh, for the scholarship, not for when I went uh, because of the, the World Youth Forum, but when I returned from there and then when I wanted to go back, uh, my father was very upset. He said, I do not want you to go. I wish you were here. But uh, everyone says, why are you preventing your son to go? Uh, and then he said to me in the airport, he was really, he was very upset. So he said, um, but uh, he said, go now. Okay, I have said yes, now you can go. But you must come back. Immediately after you finish, you come back and you serve the ones you like best, that when you are a young boy, I moved you out. Go back to agriculture, go back to the peasants and support them. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and unfortunately, I got involved in uh, the, you know, the Ethiopian and the African-American, all this racism, all these things, and the Vietnam War, yeah, all these progressive, we're all progressives at that time, I think, yeah. It's not only me. I'm pretty sure Ben Doke was also progressive at that time. <laughs> we're all like that. So at that time, we were struggling. And not only studying, but struggling. Sometimes we don't sleep because we had to do all things. So uh, I was not able to go home because the, I, the Red Terror was there. And so a lot of the students that went to Ethiopia, uh, most of them were killed. Luckily, I survived. So. Uh, even though I returned home, I could not stay long. Then I went to, I told you in the story, I went to Russia and did measurement science. I think they saved me by sending me there. That's how what happened. Then, then it was not easy for me to return home. Although I am always working, thinking to go back, but I couldn't. But at least eventually from Europe, I went to, uh, to Africa. At least uh, I went. Paul Opokomensa says, why don't you come to Ghana? that I said, let me go to South Africa. So I, I came to South Africa. <laughs> so, uh, but I think I'm in Africa. So it's, so I'm still, I'm still, uh, I'm not betraying Africa. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in there. So I'm, I'm also, I've also said to Diran, 
when he got a job in Canada, I said, no, 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 don't go to Canada. You must come to Africa. He listened to me. I can't say no to you, man. He said to me, that's why I love Dira. He came to Africa and he's doing good work. <laughs> so I think we all are trying the best we can. I think you are doing, all of us, we're struggling. In, I know the situation is complex, but we are struggling the best we can uh, to do what we can. I think, um, I, the, I mean, um, what more should I say <laughs> in, in terms of, <laughs> This is a background. I mean, the 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 fact that I I am away from and I'm globalized uh, doesn't uh, make me uh, lose my connection to Africa. In fact, the globalization helps me to strengthen uh, how we can make make Africa also reconnect with the the globe on an equal basis on the basis of mutual benefit. That that principle is what. Uh, with, I say to all of you, putting Africa first is to put humanity first. The reason is Africans were commodified. They were enslaved. Many things have happened to them. If you say uh, you recognize them to be included, then you, in fact, your humanity is asserted. So we, we must appreciate difference and uh, really celebrate our human similarity. We should go for one humanity in one world community. If we do that like that, and we have the human, the humanity life savior complex rather than the military industrial complex, we'll have a better world. So maybe Africa, if we unite Africa, it's not to unite Africa to alienate Africa from the rest of the world. It's actually to integrate Africa progressively and also with meaningfully and also uh, productively with the rest of the world. So I think some relationship like that is very critical and very important. And Africa has lost it still. Um, it, 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 look, Bentoke is, is more Pan-African. Some of these people, they don't. I mean, they they say they are Pan-African. They are uh, the Africa. They are members, but they don't practice it. They they do uh, they do the opposite things uh, the, because of self-interest. Sometimes they get whatever connections they get from different parts. Then the, what happens? They value that more than the valuing the, the uniting Africa and, and making sure. Africa stands up and uh, realizes all its rich resources to actually make uh, make everyone gain. For example, I told you many times, the solar energy in the Sahara, you know, a German has written about it, he's a professor in Germany. And you know what? We also created UNSOL, African Solar Energy Network. This That alone can give free electricity to all of Euro Africa, and including Europe all of Europe, we can actually do it. It's not a bit difficult, but the politics is rough. I mean, as you notice, it's uh, every country there is divided, many things like that. So I think we have challenges, and uh, but the globalization is not a challenge. The challenge is us. We are still divided because we have not overcome, you know, the division uh, part, and we still continue to divide ourselves and then that always is a negative for all of us especially the ordinary people look what's happening in sudan now why people die friends two generals that were friends fight why i mean and why also kill all these people so i don't know what's going on but in africa it's very complicated so i think uh, i think that's my answer for your difficult question <laughs> Thank you, Mamu. Thank you, Gessi, for posing a very difficult question to Mamu. <laughs> Gessi, do you have a, a final comment to back to Mamu? Yeah, well, I was just thinking because Mamu, among what you've shared with us is how much you have done in the space of, in a way, building programs and institutions to to strengthen the kind of capacity building, uh, you know, through programs that were not there. And I suppose at your time, you didn't have those options to come to South Africa or to go to Rwanda, wherever you've been creating these programs. And one of our concerns, though, continues to be the kind of brain drain, right? And so there are two issues there. The one is whether we can build capacity domestically, well, meaning on the continent, but also whether we have the economies uh, and the peace to then absorb that talent uh, into our space. And I just wondered if in our last minute uh, that I have with you, whether you have anything to comment on that. So yes, globalized, but uh, this brain drain issue, uh, what's your feeling about where we are headed with it? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, 
the, you see the, the the one critical thing we did uh, in 2003 uh, was I went to the University of KwaZulu Natal, and we wanted to do education integration among the universities in Africa. Luckily, we had about two million run uh, dollars uh, grant, and I was the director of it. I mean, I must tell you that the main idea we had was how do we do mobility among the staff, mobility among students, all right? Even more collaboration between Africans and the rest of Europe and America uh, the globally. How do we also create linkages? But how do we create linkages that upgrade the quality of the universities in Africa? They also make sure the inter-African university is also strengthened. We tried it. I mean, we had meetings. I had uh, all the, the conferences in, uh, in West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, everywhere we went. I mean, I, I went all over Africa and we tried very much to get the universities to come and, uh, and we're funding them. So all of them will come to the meeting. They will do come. We passed very good declarations. Implementation? No. I, I, I must tell you, the University of Cape Town, the vice chancellor, she was a lady at that time. She, I, I went and talked to her. I said, can we send some students from the University of Cape Town to go to Makerere University in Uganda? She said, but Mamo, if you say London, they will go. Stockholm, they will go. If you say to Kampala, they will not go. <laughs> That's what she said to me. <laughs> Can you imagine? They, they will not go. Terrible. So what you, what you have is, I mean, that is a problem. There are 300,000 engineers in America, Nigerian engineers. But Nigeria says it cannot, okay, fabricate or it's, it's oil because it has no engineers. <laughs> I mean, can, can you imagine? And now still, the, the oil is fabricated in America and the Nigerians buy the oil at a higher price. It still is happening. It's not changed. So I think there is a problem with the, the African mindset. I think there's a serious issue. What you just mentioned also about the students, what we are trying to do is we have the African Federation. We have the African Student Union uh, and I'm the special advisor to them. And we had the meetings. We try to get the young people to join. Really, we are trying very much like that. And uh, we are encouraging to see if we could create linkages among the young people. And, and also, uh, even some of the universities they are doing, for example, the, the Rwanda University, I'm in this uh, Africa Center of Excellence in Data Science. I supervise students there too. But you know what? The good thing about it is that they, the students that are supervised are from all over Africa. Isn't that nice? So they are getting a scholarship, things like that. But at least in Uganda, it's very nice. In uh, in uh, I, I like all of you to go to to Kigali, and uh, it's so clean, you know, no dirt. <laughs> I don't know how they did it, but it's beautiful. So I mean, there are many interesting things we are trying to do uh, to, to try to see if uh, inter-African collaboration can be made. Even now, mobility could be made. I suggested actually strongly to even the universities. In fact, now the, the delegation is going to Ethiopia from the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation. My The, the NRF uh, brother, Michael and others all are involved in it. And uh, we were involved in setting a link between how do we create linkages between innovation uh, systems and at the same time, universities from between Ethiopia and South Africa. And I think what we suggested to them is to see if they could also get mobility, the staff and student mobility to come. And things like that we could do. I mean, we've done some things, for example, with the Ethiopian. When the Global X conference happened in 2015, one of the good things that happened is that Chinese scholars came, uh, Ming Peng Tang and others. And then uh, they also went to Gondar University. Gondar University contributed something for uh, for uh, Globalix. 
And then later we got scholarships, about 20 students, uh, teachers and others now got uh, PhDs in, in China. Things like that are happening. So there are interactions we do. I mean, very good global interaction as well as inter-African interaction has to be done. In fact, I suggested to all of them to say, why don't we even one semester, even each student should spend at least in another university, in another country, in another place. Why don't we do something like that? We interlinkage and uh, like that, and then do also conferences, uh, seminars, the African Academy that we have created, uh, postgraduate academy with all these things we let's try to do. The efforts are there, but the systematization of it to the so that it creates is still very weak. What uh, Ben Doke said. I mean, the the in integration side we have not done it very well. So I think on that side we should work on it. I think we should all work together on it, and especially Africa leaks also it should be really. I'm thinking we need to find a way to make sure that it's funded by Africans also and the African Economic Commission and others should also use, remember this uh, education commission. It can be a model inside there to just mm -hmm. show them because it's got all the interlinkages. So yeah. we need to, to develop it further and really make them, you know, do Pan-African uh, solutions very systematically all also glo with global linkages. We should do it like that. I think uh, my Margaret, you should help us on this very much and all the, your team your uh, secretarial team and the board. That, it's that's... very much on the agenda, Mamu, and, and I think by virtue, but thanks a lot for, for these uh, yeah. great questions, Sir Gessi, and, and uh, yes. facilitating this. I think the very fact that the African Visiting Fellowship Program has moved to Africa and is now based at uh, Johannesburg University, University, University of Johannesburg, UDA, <laughs> and so on, is one part of this whole thing, because we never right. wanted to support this uh, Africa Leaks network and do these wonderful things that are happening uh, without being this the vision. This was from the very beginning the vision that we would that it would help generate these linkages that Mamu is talking about. I I, I really love that thinking and Thank and you. there are, there is funding both on the African continent and outside for more mobility programs. So that is definitely a priority for the Africa Leaks. Uh, scientific board and for the for the secretariat to work on this okay i should stop myself now <laughs> <laughs> i know there's uh, somebody helena tapper who is out there and wondering can't wait to pose her question um so i wonder and she has to leave uh, but radies um, can we allow a little bit of flexibility here Thank you very much. And Diran, I'll get back to you very shortly. But uh, Helena Tapa, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Kind. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Mam Mamo. Yes. How are you? you. Yes. Um, so uh, first, let me let me say that uh, I have collaborated with Mamo about fifteen years or something like that, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, as I worked um, in um, innovation uh, and science and technology in Africa yeah. uh, for nine years. And um, I share a lot of thoughts with you. Yeah. And you also uh, were kind enough to publish um, the last article of my doctoral thesis. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, so I appreciate all your work, what you have done. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, which I wrote to uh, to the chat in the chat, and and the question is that um, uh, if I can still find it, but I remember it. That uh, what are, what do you think? What are the key elements of national innovation system? Uh, I think Bengt Oke already asked uh, kind of uh, um, the question about the global scene. So we have the North, now we have the China, the, the global scene has changed now uh, or is changing. So how do you see what are the key elements of the, the national innovation system um, that a country would need to be both economically competitive in the global environment but also sustainable so that it's not only looking at economic competitiveness but also looking at sustainability in the country so if you can enlighten me about or give some some of your thoughts about that thank you 
Thank you very much. Uh, let me just give you the definitions I learned from uh, on the innovation system uh, elements and components. Uh, Chris Fre Freeman de defined uh, national system innovation as a network of institutions in the public and private sectors whose activities and interactions initiate, import, modify, and diffuse new technologies. Richard Nelson defines it as a set of institutions whose interactions determine the innovation performance of national firms. It's, uh, the theory of firms is what he linked it, the innovation system with. Lundeval defines the system of innovation as the elements and relationships which interact in the production, diffusion, and use of new and economically useful knowledge and are either located within or rooted inside the borders of a nation state. So the normative assumptions is that those nations that succeed in building economic strength relied on the science, engineering, technology, and innovation capability that, that made them to achieve an innovation advantage to put them ahead in the world. So acquiring national or regional economic leadership, uh, the case may be depending on what level of analysis is selected to look uh, uh, at particular failure, success, or progress is what is required. In Africa, I think we need to think of these interesting definitions that the, these innovation scholars have done. We should also take the element, I think we can take nearly most of what they just mentioned because they are interrelated and see if we could actually identify them, select them, and apply them and use them in, when we do data analytics and do serious research case by case and see what we can come up with to make sure that we understand it very carefully about what the innovations. I think I appreciate your uh, question very much. And um, that is my answer. I think it's better to give the answer with the key people who invented the innovation system approach. Uh, to give you exactly how they did it. And that, that's what, uh, where I'm still thinking and working on it, on this system, how, what elements we need to kind of identify and this, this sector. There are different sectors, the sectors, local, regional, all the global, these things, technology issues. There are many, many variables we can take, but we need to identify how we can interlink them too. We need to mm -hmm. make some unification also, uh, systematization. We need to work on that too. That's my suggestion. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, and and Helena Tapa, you are muted, but I also I'm afraid we have to pass uh, the floor on to Diran. So I'm sure that you have a strong and uh, close connection with Bamu, and you can continue this interesting discussion and in, outside so this forum, if that's okay. And thanks for for joining. Oh, wow, she disappeared. Okay, <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to cut anything short, but. Um, but Diran, it's uh, over to you now. Um, and uh, Diran, uh, you are an associate professor of innovation policy and management at the Witch uh, Business School in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, you have also collaborated for a long time with Mamu and so on. So can I ask you to take the floor, maybe say a little bit about, now I'm learning my lesson here. So maybe say a little bit about <laughs> your praise <laughs> for uh, Mamu and then also post your question, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Margarita. And uh, thanks, greetings to everyone. Um, and thanks for the warm introduction as well. I've worked with you as well in the Africa Leaks context. Uh, Geshe is my sister friend, co-lecturer, co co-traveler, co-researcher and everything. And Prof <laughs> Mamo is, is our grand master teacher. Uh, so I came across Prof Mamo's work during my doctoral studies uh, in a course called Comparative Science and Technology taught by Susan Cousins. And it was the most uh, internationally oriented course and the innovation systems uh, concept theory came up uh, very prominently. And so of course we know that the founding theories of innovation systems and uh, probably the most influential are Richard Nelson, Bengt Dalke Lundvall and Chris Freeman. And what occurred to me very quickly was the very strong US flavor of Richard Nelson's theorization of innovation systems. It's very uh, R&D based, large firm, 
So it suggests that he theorized from uh, a North American and particularly a US environment. And uh, Chris Freeman, although international in scope, uh, uh, is theorized from a UK perspective comparing to Japan and so on. And Prof. Luna is theorizing from a Scandinavian perspective. So the local is global because these are contributions to global knowledge pool. And as best as I was with that, uh, the knowledge and the theory and conceptualizations and, and feeling resonance in it, I said, well, there's no way uh, that you can theorize from a different context and apply it directly to a new context. And my interest was always in Africa, not just applying knowledge, but theorizing from an African context. So when I came across the work of, by uh, almost the analogous situation, the three most influential leading theorists of innovation systems in Africa, the late great professor Kalestos Juma, uh, Professor Oyebanji Oyelaron Yeyinka, and Professor Mamomuchi, I said, well, this is what I'm looking for. I want theorization from African data, African empirical realities, African perspectives that can nevertheless speak to the rest of the world. And so and it was in the global context I first uh, met Professor Mamomuchi. So from the page to real life, I was blown away. Uh, and his rich language brings to life the written pages, which are detailed in writing. But at the end of the day, you can only remember so much unless you're studying or cramming for a test. You want, what is the bigger purpose? What does this mean? And that really lifted me up and said, once I finish my studies, I need to find people like this to uh, be part of my community. And surprise, to my surprise, he was accessible, almost as if I'd known him forever, as if it was my father or uncle, and has supported me concretely, introducing me to various networks, bringing me along to Africa Lakes, to the Africana Postgraduate Academy, working with me, supporting me, giving me a lot of work to do, reviewing <laughs> papers for his journal, <laughs> and so on. But one person you cannot say no to is Professor Mao Mochi. So uh, I welcome the challenge because I know I have much more to gain from the mentorship than uh, whatever time I'm spending. So that is, uh, I join Geshe in, 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 in giving all due honor to Prof. Mamo. So, um, so I transition to my question is, is essentially, uh, theoretically, I think you have been very important in, this, in contributing to the innovation systems perspective. In your biography, you know that very early on, you had a clear appreciation of the knowledge that your grandmother had uh, that she drew on, in that case, medicinal knowledge that she used to treat you and your family. And, and you know, healthcare is, is a life and death issue. If you're sick and sick for too long, you know, you don't live. And you value that at a very young age. Now you went to the most elite institutions in the world. You taught at the most elite institution in the world. You were mentored by your friends with the most accomplished scholars, yet you never gave up this notion that there's something that my grandmother knows that all the Sussexes and Cambridges of the world don't know and cannot teach me. And that shows up uh, for me, the first time I saw it is in your chapter in Putting Africa First on Reconceptualizing the NSN and African Context, where you talked about the food heritage, in particular the cereal heritage in the Ethiopian highlands and elsewhere across the world, and the necessity of maintaining genetic crop diversity, uh, food security, sustainability in the context, starting from the ancient knowledge heritage. So this idea of indigenous knowledge, ancestral knowledge is a persistent theme that you introduce moderately at first and is becoming more prominent in, in, in your appeals. Uh, I think you can tell that world uh, contemporary science may not have its roots in the traditional West, sometimes mathematics, astronomy, uh, medical knowledge may have its roots in so-called pre-industrial, pre-modern societies, but there's an essential hybridity to modernity. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics are as indigenous to Africa as they are to any part of the world. So this notion of indigeneity is a hybrid concept in your work that speaks to a value orientation, a democratic, pluralistic orientation. A number of people can have it as long as they're committed, but it's also uh, precision-based science. 
And all of that is part of our indigenous heritage. So I guess my question to you following on that is to say, uh, the Lix community, which you've modified by introducing K, Lix implies an emphasis on competence building, assuming a laggard status. And you're saying, well, these so-called laggards have something to our capital K, which is knowledge. We just need to understand it, appreciate it, and evaluate it differently. How do you think the Lix community or the Clix community in your terminology can better incorporate uh, this knowledge, this literature uh, that is outside of the domain of peer reviewed journals of highly cited high impact factor journals, but is no less trivial in the Africa, is even more important in the African context because so many are reliant on it and we're in danger of losing it. How might we incorporate that into uh, this uh, research program that we're involved in the LIX community in a way that makes it part of the common sense of emerging Africans such that, that proposals, recommendations they make reflect an African interest uh, in conversation with other parts of the world? A subsidiary question is, what do you see as positive examples in your work in practice or in uh, the research arena that show um, some promise that this approach can be followed and, and signals for, for us uh, young and emerging researchers. Uh, I hope I've, I'm, I'm making some sense there. Thanks, Prof. Thank you very much for a very important question. And uh, what you just said about licks and clicks. I think if we add K in the licks, then we can make it knowledge. Knowledge could be indigenous knowledge plus also the current modern knowledge. They can be added to. So maybe it would be nice to from leaks we we change it to clicks, global clicks. <laughs> but so since Bentoke and all of you are here, maybe uh, I challenge you to make it clicks rather than leaks. <laughs> but uh, uh, joking aside. Uh, the questions you are asked are very important. Let me just say with the food security, let me start with that. You remember the crop, the Ethiopian crop F yes. uh, in Jera. It is now they say, if you eat that food, you don't get fat and you don't get cancer. Any disease free, you can be. The, in fact, uh, a, a science science student with the, was doing work on the library, uh, in the laboratory uh, in the University of Pretoria and myself, we wrote two papers on F. Maybe I'll send you the papers. Uh, exactly why that crop, if you see in Ethiopia, you don't see most of the women there, they're never fat. Uh, it's hard to find because they eat injera all the time. <laughs> because injera is very, uh, you know, fat, fat free, and many things. There's no things that make you like that. So, so the the traditional uh, food we have, and the tr the traditional knowledge, uh, the crops, everything is very interesting. I was also listening to a lecture once by a, a, doc a doctor called Rita from India. I was just fascinated by in the ancient time. The in the indigenous knowledge, they the the the, the, the climates, the impact they do in the agriculture, the things they do, will not have uh, will not affect the climate, will not affect their health. Many things like that they were telling us like this. It's incredible. I was uh, fascinated to hear it. In fact, I had the PowerPoint one day. If I get a chance, I'll send it to all of you. You just be fascinated by. It. In, in she addressed these issues of the current COVID nineteen. Because if we go back to our traditional way by which we're doing it, in most cases, it does not impact. You know, it doesn't have all this uh, climate impact, carbon impact, many things like that, where the manufacturing and everything does. She says something like that. So I think this is a serious issue about how we actually do, how we grow the kind of products, what we eat, what we do, all matter in terms of actually having impact to the our earth and the climate, many things like that will also have. But the other things you said is the, the knowledge heritage, the spiritual heritage, all right? Uh, in, in Africa is very rich. 
they say humanity was originated in Africa. You see, I mean, we're all humans. We're all the, the same. And if humanity originated from Africa and uh, slavery times is over the last 500 years, until then, there was huge amount of knowledge that was created. For example, I don't know, you know, more, uh, how many of you know about Imhotep? You know him, eh? He was a genius of geniuses. He was the Einstein of Einstein. What didn't he know? On every sphere of knowledge, astronomy, all right, science, medicine, architecture, in every sphere, he had extraordinary. I made a, actually, I can send you the, the lecture I gave on the, the International uh, Internship University that is now also created to, again, we create, this is another university where I'm also involved, where we're trying to see if we could in, include this indigenous knowledge very systematically. So we're working on it. And Imhotep, when the lecture I gave, they were very fascinated because even myself, I just was amazed that we had, and he's African. I mean, the ancient time, an African like that, when we, we, to, to, we you know, uh, created this extraordinary knowledge. And, and then what wasn't created in, in the Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, in the ancient uh, language called Giz, in the ancient, the calendar itself, we had a professor called Professor Stephen Rubinson. He's Swedish, a very nice, he used to live in Lund. In fact, he told me to stay one week in his house. And we were on 2007, we, were, we both were invited to give a keynote address in Oslo uh, for the Ethiopian millennium. You know what he said? The Ethiopian calendar, the Ethiopian alphabet is better than the Roman and Latin alphabet. When you say C, you say S-E-A and C. When you say U, you say Y-O-U. I mean, you say B, you say B. So many of the letters are confused, he said. But when you, in Ethiopia, pa, pa, cha, and any sound you can express. He is expressed with the letters, the, the uh, scripts, he said. And then he, he, they gave him 11 minutes standing ovation. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget that. You not believe it. And he, you know what he also said? When he was first sent to Ethiopia, he went to Ethiopia. He was sent as a mission missionary to do mission, uh, uh, you know, church thing. When I went there, I saw the country and I saw the manuscripts everything, all the knowledge I start seeing. And I said, I apologize, he said. I said, no, I cannot come and preach Christianity to the country where Judaism, Christianity, and Muslim started. The origin is Ethiopia, he said. He said, he said it himself. And then he said that about the calendar also, he says the lunar, solar, and spiritual side is also connected. And all of you will get seven years also, uh, you'll be younger by seven years, he said. And everybody was fascinated by him. All I'm simply saying to you is that there's so much created, there was so much knowledge that exists, but and, and that has been created. And some of the professors like Stephen Rubinson, who create who was the first one who went to Addis Ababa University and, and uh, created the history department. He's uh, from Sweden. And and Sweden we give them credit, they gave a lot of support to actually set up the universities in Ethiopia. They really did, um, sincerely. So we, are, we appreciate them. All I'm simply saying to you is that because we got these interesting people, then what happens is you have fascinating people. We also had, you know, uh, Sylvia Pankras and so on. They all became, you know, in the Second World War when Ethiopia was attacked. She she came to Ethiopia and fought for us. I mean, and then now we have Alula Pankras. He speaks Amharic. He married an Ethiopian. This, I mean, we have these kind of connections which are good, very nice. I mean, some connections also from the north that come and, and genuine people can uh, interact and connect with us. But the, what he just said is extremely important. The, the indigenous knowledge, all right? Uh, this knowledge heritage is rich. I mean, you and I have written a paper on it already. And I think I'm challenging you, we need to write a book together on it. If you don't do that, uh, what would Mamo do to you? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> so I, I think we need to do it systematically. I must tell you that some of the knowledge, for example, Abu Shakar and the, the astronomy, 
The book is extraordinary. It's written in the ancient language, Ethiopian. I wish I could read it. And I was in Ethiopia. I went to a kind called the the the, the Likalikal means the 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 knowledge of knowledge, the the the, the knowledgeable knowledge man is a rich man. His name is Ezra, and he gave me an, a five hours lecture on fractal mathematics. Can you imagine? I mean, there's fractal mathematics. I heard it. I couldn't sleep for two days after I heard that mathematics. I swear to you, I was amazed. I mean, then there is binary logic mathematics. The entire, in fact, we wrote a book on uh, mathematical modeling and engineering design. It's, uh, uh, Margaret, you should be very happy. It's your financial support uh, from uh, uh, Africa Leaks and CEDA that we got the support. And we did, when I did the mathematical modeling, I put that thing. It's an extraordinary thing what, what has happened, to, to be honest with you. And, and this fractal, this uh, binary logic mathematics is the entire internet system uses it, the same mm. mathematical model. Mm. In fact, Ethiopia should ask for intellectual property right for all this internet and get some. <laughs> There's also, for example, on philosophy, serious matter. On, there's a book called Hateta, Claude Summoner, he's from uh, Canada. He's Canadian uh, professor. He came to Ethiopia, teaching again in Addis Ababa University. He learned the ancient Ethiopian language, Giz, and he, he translated Hateta, which is, the, which is written by the, uh, the, the, the one of the professors, the, the, the creators of uh, this one. And you know what this man said in, in the book? He said, poor people are more happy than rich people. The rich people, he said, are what? They, they get more unhappy because every time they need something, they want more than Since they want, they, they, they don't get it, they get upset, he said. The other thing he said is about uh, the African enlightenment he created 200 years before the European enlightenment and reason. He explained, about that also very well. I can give you also the, the reasons. You know who, 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 where I read it? From Claude Summoner, not from the, the book because I don't know the, the Giz language. I started it, but I never really learned it. I really want to really get it because, and I must tell you that in the Giz language, over 21 universities across Africa, across Europe and America teach it, to teach the, the, this Giz language, including in Hamburg in uh, mm. Germany. In fact, the German was speaking, we had a conference on innovation excellence on Ethiopia. The German spoke, he said, I prefer this language than my own language. He said that to us in a meeting, I don't know why. <laughs> so all I'm Thank simply you. saying to you is that the African knowledge heritage is very rich and that heritage must be included in the curriculum. We need to create these two universities. We have the international appropriate, uh, international international university and the international, the Austrian University, and or even all other universities that exist, if we are able to motivate the bureaucracy to uh, manage the bureaucracy, I think we should include it very systematically. And that's the best way to do it. That's my, my strong suggestion. But I really know. And now, Mamu, because I'm <laughs> sorry, Mamu. Sorry, sorry. With, with the running the risk of losing my very good relationships with you and Tiran, <laughs> okay, <sorry. laughs> I have to try to uh, to, to manage uh, time. Sorry. Yeah, a little bit. Yes, yes. Because sorry, we also sorry. do have some questions uh, in the oh, chat okay. and so oh, on. Right. So if it's okay, but Diran, do you have a final uh, comment to Mamu before we? No, no. Thank you very much. Let's hear from the audience. Thank you, yeah. Margaret. So thanks a lot uh, to you guys in the and and ladies in the uh, yeah. in the uh, panel for great yeah. questions to Mamo. It's uh, been a pleasure listening to to your yes. interactions with yeah. Mamo. Very interesting. Uh, I um, I now have the pleasure of asking Dr. Michael Afulabi to pose his question because I think and I picked this one particularly well I think because it is a very challenging question to all of us not just to Mamu but to everybody. Okay. Thank so, you. so, but Mamu, you will be the one to answer today. So, <laughs> <laughs> for all of you, <laughs> for all of us, yes, and maybe another day we, the rest of us, can continue the discussion. But uh, so, Dr. Michael Afulabi, are you here? Yeah, I am. Uh, thank you. Please go ahead. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mamu. So, 
here's my question, uh, which is based on uh, an observation. Uh, so the observation first. Um, if if I if we look at African scholars, uh, whether they are uh, when I mean when I say African scholars, I mean contemporary African scholars, whether they are philosophers, medical scientists, economists, most of them uh, seem uh, to to lack uh, Pan African awareness, and this can be discerned from their writings and publications. And if I, if I look at my own experience with Africans who work within the field of innovation and uh, my interactions uh, with them goes back to 2009 uh, at Senegal Globalist Conference. I, I've also observed that a lot of uh, these African innovation scholars, quote and unquote, also tend to lack the Pan-African awareness. So my, my question is this, if the biologist, if the medical scientist doesn't have a Pan-African orientation and that orientation is missing from the, the trajectory of their research, and if uh, some of the African innovation researchers also lack this same Pan-African outlook, then how can we uh, move to, to, to that sphere where we can have a Pan-African reality? Because the, the little realities, the little niches that should create this different streams of Pan-African oriented research and practices, if they are missing, then uh, we may not be able to accomplish in the practical sense, uh, a, a Pan-African way of appropriating whatever we may derive from innovation. And let me quickly draw you back to something that happened in 2018 uh, in Finland. Uh, we were at Finland and you, had, and you were evaluating uh, uh, one of the uh, doctoral students who had uh, who was doing PhD at that time, I think at the University in Japan. And his work focused primarily on comparing tractors made by Chinese uh, companies and uh, tractors made by Japanese companies. And you had made a remark that such a line of research uh, offered little or nothing to the African reality. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we have to try. I have to ask uh, people who post questions to be a little bit brief uh, so that we can manage more questions. Uh, but um, my, uh, Mamo, do you want to yes. respond to the question? Yes, a brief response. On the Pan African side, we have the Pan African University. I'm also part of that university. And they have the, they, they definitely uh, have different. Uh, uh, parts of it's located in uh, Yaoundé in uh, Nigeria in Kenya uh, in many places and they are, uh, one of the areas is on innovation related one so the key question now is how do we also motivate I think I, I, I like also collaboration maybe Africa leagues and others should also be joining so that we can then see if we could uh, find ways by which we can train. Africalix is also doing uh, academies and so on, where all many Afri uh, African students from all parts are joining. And we have also the uh, African Postgraduate Academy. We're also training the same thing. We're connecting, we're doing it in different parts. So there are many things uh, we are uh, starting to train. And, but I think the main thing, uh, the, just uh, very important, this one, we need to include, create very good um, the curriculums were on the innovation area and, and include them in, the, in all the universities. I think that's something we need to work on. How we can motivate that, we need to discuss ourselves and find a, an approach where we can reach out to all of them, see if we can, because this is a very, very good research area. It must be acknowledged. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the the Nobel uh, Academic in Stockholm that had a 
they invited me at a meeting and I told them that the, they should include the innovation area. There are many serious scholars that have created. Why don't you also, in the field, you see, they don't have the innovation area. They have economics, but they don't add it. So I said, you should even include it. At least they took notes. I don't know whether they still include it. <laughs> I hope, I'm sure I hope, they I do. I mean, who will not listen when you talk, Mamu? You have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. okay, thank you very thank you. much. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Um, I would like to call upon Sigui Du. Sorry if I'm, my pronunciation of Chinese names is not the best, but uh, yeah, you're there. Thank you. Yes. yes. Hi. So Thank please, because you. You, you, you had two questions, but I suggest that you focus on the second question, please. Okay, okay. Um, uh, thank you for proper uh, mood, Mom, for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, for me, I mostly focus on the uh, I would say the agriculture development. So from my understanding, recently yes, um, the group songs, especially the BRICS, the countries play the more important role in uh, uh, group songs, economical and they are how to say uh, uh, especially uh, under the context of the UK, um, Ukraine and uh, Russia conflicts. Now the BRICS countries, now they have more, uh, uh, how to say, the, uh, mm, they, they have more independent role and in their discourse on how to uh, better develop their own economical uh, paths for the future. So what do you um, say uh, these uh, uh, BRICS countries, uh, for them, the opportunity and the challenges for them to uh, build a better uh, economical uh, future for them countries. Thank you. Yes. So, Hello? Mamo, I think, yes. yeah? Yes. Can you hear? Did you hear the yes. question? Yeah. Yes, About I have, the, I've heard the, the role question. of the BRICS. Yeah. The role of the BRICS, yes. So uh, what I notice is that the BRICS now are, uh, uh, let me just say this thing about the BRICS, the G20, uh, G, uh, G7, uh, all these divisions that we have. Um, I think it would be nice if there is a way, the collaboration is, is not, when they form these organizations, it's not to delink from others and relink with each other, it could be, it, it should be, a, globalization should continue, I think. I think that would be the best. But if uh, it's not continuing, it's going to affect because uh, the linkages might be a problem. Now we're having serious issues. Remember what happened in the G7 meeting. Now China is very, very upset because what was decided there was not something that they thought is fair. So we have challenges like this. So we don't. I, do, I don't know how this is going to affect even the economic sphere. The other thing you mentioned is on agriculture. I think the one good thing from China, all of us could learn is if when uh, Ch Chairman Mao came, the first thing he did, which was extra extraordinary, was what must we do? First, we must change agriculture, the farmer. If we don't, when he said that, he, he didn't think in terms of just making uh, creating the better tools about how the, the farming must be done. He said the farmer's life completely, the education, the health, every sphere must be done. I mean, that was uh, how it, China started. Let's start from the rural areas and then transform when we do that. And I think China now has achieved uh, some extraordinary things, which means absolute poverty, they say, is now abolished. I think something has been done no matter what uh, mistakes or anything are made, some interesting things have come out of China also. But what we need now is uh, collaboration, not just, in, in, uh, I mean, like recently China has a meeting with the ASEAN, five ASEAN countries and, and things like that. And you have Japan also not relating to, South Korea not relating to China and things. We have all these conflicts and I prefer that we find a solution. Uh, really a much more integrated solution uh, that does not make the economic to be uh, silos but in different groups, but it must come out of these groups. That's my strong recommendation. Thank you very much. 
Thanks a lot. Very nice uh, conversation here. Uh, we have two more questions. And uh, as we uh, turn to those two speakers uh, and, or those two questions, uh, can I ask the audience if there are more questions coming, then please uh, place them in the chat and be very brief. Uh, questions not answered in the session will, will uh, be sent to Mamu for, for comments. Uh, but uh, can I ask Bansiuhun um, Tesasu? Are you here? Are you with us? Yes, yes I can see you From here. Canada. Yeah, okay. Please come in. And post your question if, if you want. And uh, kindly be, be free, uh, well, as brief as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Bantu? Uh, am I audible? Yes, Hello? how are you? Nice to see uh, you. Fine. Yes, you fine. are. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, a human body is worth over a billion dollars if we look at the functional organic level. Now we have a rising uh, African community. If we can be able to trust, educate, raise awareness and engage every human being is an asset to not just themselves, but to the global economy. How can we engage these people? to be productive enough as consumers and producers so that we can be able to achieve sustainable, holistic development that would address all the existing and future issues that are going to be in front of us in all directions. We have to show some kind of paradigm shift. Can you comment on that, please? Thank you. Thanks yes. a lot, Mamu. That's a tall yes. order. Yes. I think I think there's a very important question. I think, is there any chance we can make a paradigm shift from competition to collaboration? Or creating some way by which competition and collaboration, competition does not, all right, uh, devalue collaboration. But with... If we can do collaboration with competition, it's very good. If we simply go to coll collaborate, to, to, go, to uh, compete for the self-interest, to win self-interest, and if you don't win your self-interest, you even go to war, you even go to attack your, uh, the people who, who, uh, who gain, and you, when you think you've lost, then the, the entire mindset is, good, is, is horrible. It has to change. The, the, this, unless this change takes place, what you said is not going to happen. So, but for, for, for us to change this, uh, I don't know how we can do it. We have the United Nations. We declare uh, peace, security, love, and, and everything. But what happens? Those who are in the, who sign this still go to war, conflict, competition for economic gain and many things. So my suggestion, my strong suggestion is there must be collaboration. There must be a way where poverty, unemployment, no one should be hungry, no one should be thirsty, no one should be shelterless, some new approach where all humanity can be saved because the planet has enough resources to save all of us if we know how to manage it. How do we manage it together? How do we make it, uh, make the, the, all the uh, various actors, the quadruple helices function together with collaboration is something we need to create. That new approach might, might require new innovation, the humanity innovation system approach. Maybe we should ask also, we should add another variable, <laughs> not just uh, technology, <laughs> all right? Region, uh, global, uh, local, uh, sectoral, but also human. Human innov humanity innovation system. <laughs> Maybe that will help us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mamo. And yes, collaboration for, for the common good is, is, a, is an important yes. way. Forward. Thank you. Um, so there is uh, one question from uh, Mariam uh, from Iran. Um, oh. And uh, she has unfortunately left, I think. Yes, yeah, so, but I'm going to read it out because uh, it's an interesting question and, and it's directed both to you, Mamu, and also to Professor Lundwald. 
So the, the question reads, you co-authored the book Putting Africa First in 2003, which I understand has contributed to the national system of innovations in South Africa. I wish to know from both of you how successful the adoption of the NIS, the National Innovation Systems approach has been in South Africa and the probable reasons for that. I'm from Iran and I'm thinking whether there's any successful model elsewhere of adoption of NIS as a national policy to serve as potential template for Iran. And yes. much as uh, Mariam is not here, I'm sure she will get the recording. So kindly, can I ask uh, both of you to try to address this question? If Bal is there, let him start. <laughs> let him go first. Okay, Bal, yeah, you are he here. Has to go I can first. see you. <laughs> um, uh, I, I am not qualified. No. Uh, <laughs> Mamo uh, has uh, worked and lived in South Africa for a long time. Uh, <laughs> If anybody should be qualified, he should be. So I leave the floor to. <laughs> what a wise, wise reply. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Bal. But um, the, the, the national system of innovation um, from the book we did, uh, as I, we, I mentioned to you we, many times, is that we are thinking about how to create an African system of innovation in other words we make it uh, uh we even wrote a book uh the, the you know Af uh, uh, the african nation as a nation in other words to go beyond all these different states that are fractured that are done in a way that are now created so many conflicts because the division the boundaries were art art artificially done they are not realistically done for example if you go to uh, south africa there's a people called Nebedele. They are in Zimbabwe and they are also in South Africa. But but now they they don't. Uh, they are those that are they say that they're in Zimbabwe, say that they are different as if they are different from South Africa. But it, although they speak the same language, we have this kind of similar challenges everywhere in Africa. We have boundaries that are really very cynically drawn, and they do not make sense. So the best way to overcome them is to bring unity. So we said African unity. The South African uh, national system of innovation is a white paper. There, there is an, a, a, an effort being done in, in terms of trying to create the, the national system of innovation. And the third time it is coming out, the still the innovation system document is there. But in, in terms of the inclusion of the excluded population, the unemployment rate is very high still. Many challenges still exist. And I think, as I mentioned to you, we're thinking about Tibet colleges and others to try to really, you know, reframe them so that we can include those that are vulnerable. Many things like that we are still thinking in the context of South Africa. So that's the, the uh, really that thing. The other thing about Iran, I was recently in Iran. I met uh, Dr. Mariam. She's very uh, active. They have a series of conference. In fact. Uh, but, uh, ben Tokyo also has been invited before and he went to the same conference. They invited me to be a keynote and I addressed it. I went last time and we did discuss we, we did discuss also very much about the innovation system, how in in Iran they should try to make it more not not to include religion, all these things, but more you know the, do it in a systematic way where relationships can also be done in and also the people in Iran also can all benefit. Some some new approach should be done. And uh, and then if possible, we could all learn from each other's situation. For example, all the innovation system ideas, all the, the from every part that has been done, lessons, we don't need to copy and mimic, but we can also learn from what has been done. And I think Iran can also do our own systematic um, um, uh, national system of innovation also. That's what we we discussed. And Iran in the ancient time was has uh, in the Persian time was has a great uh, con contribution to many things. So they can continue still to do many interesting things. So we discussed something like that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And we are coming to an end now. Uh, Sigui, can you be very brief in your last question, please? Okay. Thank you. Uh, my, for my last question is about the. How can we adapt uh, empower uh, women and the youth for that uh, sustainable development? Because 
um, to be honest, I have all, uh, I have three years work um, experience in Ghana, and the most uh, impressive thing is that uh, for my com uh, for my company's customers, uh, there are a lot of uh, women and uh, youth. They are better, you know, argue for the order price and the uh, other things. So, in a different thanks, era, thanks, Sigui. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mamo? Yes, I think I think the youth must be the change makers and the game changers. And the women also are the mothers and sisters, so they must be valued. So what I think we should do is whenever jobs and many things are created, we should include, they should be included, they should be inclusive. It should not be done just uh, by those who have the money and who have the control, who have the political connections, and things like that. It should be, how do we also include those who, are, who may be vulnerable if they are excluded? We must include them. So an inclusive approach is critically important. Inclusive, not exclusive. And so let's include the women and the youth all over the world, not just in Africa. That's what my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamo. And um, to all of you for a very great session here. Uh, I'm turning now to my vote of thanks because uh, I know time has uh, been flying here. So first of all, I want to thank Mamo, of course. Mamo, again and again. Thank you so much for making my life easy. And can we have I a smile. big hand for, for Mamo? It was wonderful to, to be with you here today, really. Oh, thank you. I thank learned you. a lot from you and uh, I'm sure people have valued this uh, today being with you. Mm. Uh, I want to thank you also for being engaged as always because you always take people serious and try to answer the questions in a good way so thank you very much for that thank you um I, there's also a special thanks from me of course uh, to the panelists to Bengdorke, to diran and to gesi but not least there's a thank you very much to all three of you it's been a pleasure and then finally, I want to uh, give a very big uh, thank you and an applause to Rajes and his team. Mm -hmm. You are there behind this series. You mm -hmm. are organizing it from the very yes, beginning yes. to the very end. And you are a true inspiration to all of us. Thank you very much for what you have done to bring all these scholars together. You did it during the COVID-19, but you are <laughs> continuing. I love it. It's fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And I think this is it from me for today. I see uh, people, if people want to put on their cameras, I'm sure they are allowed to do so. So we can uh, see each other and say goodbye and uh, until next time. But with those words, I think I'm handing back to you, Rajes, or to the team, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. Let us all switch on the cameras so that we can take a picture. Whoever available, please, for a moment. <laughs> yeah, please. Switch on the cameras. Let's take a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want more pictures, more people. <laughs> Ooh, Ooh, Dynamica. Ooh, Dynamica. Dynamica has been the anchor of this uh, program. She is, she is the, she, she will, will Anamika speak a few words? Would you like to thank everyone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was a wonderful session. It was great listening to Mamu and Margaret and uh, Professor Lundewal and Tiran and Ketri. And um, I'm honored to be here amongst uh, all these um, scholars and be part of this wonderful discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for participating. And um, yeah. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> Right. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. I have... <laughs> bye bye. Buzz. Thank you so much, Buzz, for bye, bye. Thank bye you. Bye. <laughs> okay. 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 Yes. Thank you.
राजेश अरे 